Amen. Would you remain standing? Everybody remain standing. Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Would you make this faith declaration out loud? Come on, say it out loud. Say, I believe that God wants me to win. Come on, say it again. I believe that God wants me to win. Now, how many of you know if you tell a lie long enough, you'll believe it? Come on. And how many know if you tell the truth long enough, you'll believe it? Come on. And, and it's just such an honor to be here with you guys and to be back with Pastor Michael and Anastasia and, and uh, to, to meet you again. And I just, I just want to share this with you. Can I tell you this? God truly wants you to win in every area of your life, not just in our faith, but he wants us to win in our families. He wants us to win in our health. He wants us to win in our finances. He wants us to win in our careers, our, our, our secret thought life. He wants us to win in every arena. Jesus is not returning for a bunch of losers. Come on. He's coming back for a victorious church, a spotless bride, a church that knows how to win. And, and so I, I just want you to know that, that God is for you. Do you believe that? Well, I hope you believe that. If you're watching online, we declare that over you today, and we're so honored to be here. Pastor, thank you so much. I'm so glad to have my son here with me on Father's Day. This is my baby boy, Jacob. Would y'all welcome him? I'm glad to have him here. And, uh, and uh, my name is Johnny. I see a whole bunch of people I've never seen before. And so that's good news. Uh, so my name is Johnny. I don't know all of you. Uh, so on the count of three, would everybody tell me your name as loud as you can? Here we go. One, two, three. All right. Now I know everybody. All right. Hey, I, 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 I truly believe that I am here on assignment. Uh, I'm not just here because there was just a calendar date. I don't believe it's just something that because I was in the area that this worked out, I truly believe I'm on assignment. And how many of you love your pastors? Do you love them? Do you love your pastors? <laughs> Amen. And I've watched them just grow from uh, teenagers, literally from teenagers, to see the man and woman of God and the leaders that you are. And, and they are uh, anointed pastors. I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm an evangelist. And so today you're going to be under the anointing of an evangelist. And we're truly asking what the Apostle Paul said, that I earnestly desire to be with you so that I may impart this spiritual gift. Amen? And I am nothing. I, I'm five foot eight and mm, pounds. All right? You can figure out how many pounds another time, all right? But I'm nothing. But the anointing of our God is in this room. And he has something. If you're, on, if you're watching online, he has it for you as well. That he wants to rub something on you today. He wants to place something on you far more than a sermon. Because you're going to forget what I say by the time you hit the parking lot. Come on. But you're not going to forget what God says to you today. And so I want us to pray for two things. First of all, I want us to pray for God's anointing. Everyone say God's anointing. The Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's, it's not wonderful worship. It's not an excited evangelist. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. So here's the rules today, all right? I need you to help me if you've never been. How many of you were with me last time I was here? Wave at me if you remember my ugly face. How many of you, this is the first time you've ever seen me? Hold your hand up so I can see you. Oh, fresh meat. Hallelujah. All right. Well, here's the rules today, all right? If I say something that sounds good, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good, all right? If I say something you don't like, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good, okay? So you got to help me preach. Help me this morning, all right? And, and it helps me uh, to preach better when I know you're preaching with me. Second thing I want us to pray for is an open heart. Everybody say an open heart. Boy, if you'll open your heart today. Listen, today could be the day that heaven says yes. And over everything the enemy's attacked you with, over everything the enemy has tried to hurt you with, there's a God who loves you and a God who wants to help you to know that you can walk through anything if you hold his hand. Amen? Would you lift your hands to heaven? Can we ask for his anointing to come? Father, I thank you, Lord, for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, those that are watching online, those that are in this room. And, Lord, we're not here today for a, a church name. We're not here for a man. We're here, oh, God, to contact you and for you to contact us. And that, Lord, that we would connect with you, you would connect with us. And that, Lord, that you would speak to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, Girl, that, Lord, we would not just be in a building, oh God, but we would encounter the anointing of the living God. So let your anointing come and touch every person in this room. Lord, lift me above my abilities. And, Lord, I just pray that you would give me a word to speak of life to every person that's here. And when we leave in just a few minutes, we'll leave built up 
and edified and strengthened and better than we were when we came in to fulfill what you've called us to do in this day. And we believe for miracles, signs, and wonders in this place today. And if you agree, everybody say amen. Hey, before you're seated, would you look at somebody next to you right in the eyes and say, today is your day to get pregnant. Would you tell them right now? Just go ahead and tell somebody right now, would you? <laughs> you can be seated. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. I see some of those mamas like, you better shut your mouth. All right, okay. I see some of those daddies like, I'm going to get you after this service. Don't even say that. No, I'm not talking about the natural. Uh, this is Father's Day. And uh, my wife gave me the three greatest gifts I've ever received in my life. And my son, John David, my, my baby girl, uh, Abigail, and my baby boy, Jacob. But I found this out before you can ever give birth. How many of you know you got to conceive? And so what I'm asking today is that the Lord would help us conceive something in the realm of the Spirit so that we can give birth to something in the realm of the Spirit. Amen? And I need you to believe with me. Open your Bibles if you got them with you or your, your device if you have it with you. Or if you don't, they'll have it on the screen in a moment. To the book of Ezekiel chapter 37 and beginning of verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 37 and beginning of verse 1. And we'll look at God's word there together in just a moment. Ezekiel chapter 37 beginning in verse 1. I'd like for all the dads to stand up if they would. I just want to declare a word of life over you. All the daddies. Look at me, men, if you would. God has given you such an amazing amazing assignment that the Bible says children are arrows in the hands of a warrior and that God has given you the privilege and the honor of guiding the next generation into the power of the things of God and that you're imparted to them not just you're not just a provider you're the prophet of your house come on you're, and, and most men see themselves as providers, and they want their wives to be the spiritual leaders of their households. And thank God for our wives, and we honored them on Mother's Day. But we're honoring all of you as fathers. If you're at home and you're a father, you stand up. And we want you to know that God wants to anoint you, to empower you, to break the powers of hell off of your household, off of your marriage, off of the enemy that tries to walk in your home. And I want to challenge every father, when you go home today, grab the threshold of your front door. Here, here's what the Lord said to me driving over here this morning. Grab the threshold of your front door and say, and, and anoint it. If you'll remember in Ezekiel chapter 12, they said, when I see the blood, everybody say that, when I see the blood. They put the blood of a lamb over the doorpost. And when they did, every enemy had to pass over. That's why we still celebrate the Passover. And as the patriarch of your household, as the husband of your, uh, of your, of your wife and, and the, the father of your children, we're going to ask you whether you have them in your home with you or they're distant from you. Grab the threshold of your home today when you go home and say, Father, cover this house in your blood that no enemy can come in our home. Amen. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he did it then, can he do it now? Come on. So would you stretch your hands toward all these fathers, all these uh, young ones and, and children and wives and, and loved ones, would you pray? Father, we just pray for every father that's standing in this room. And I, as a father, I stand today understanding the awesome privilege and responsibility that I have to prophesy over my wife, to prophesy over my children, to declare life over my household. And I just pray on this Father's Day, God, that something will be imparted to them, that when they grab the threshold of their door, when they go home today, and they ask for the blood covering of the Lamb of God over their household that every enemy will have to be pushed back. The demon powers will have to be broken and that, Lord, that your favor will be over their household in a new way today and bless these men. Give them health. Bless their finances. Bless their home and let them step into their God authority to speak over their household and that they'll be that man of God in Jesus' name. And we bless them. And if we love all these dads, would you give them a great, great, great big hand? Amen. Amen. I believe that we're living maybe in the greatest time possibly in the history of the church. Uh, now, some of you look at me and, and you might say, hey, wait a minute, time out. Uh, we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, people are still not going back to work. Uh, uh, lumber is at an all-time high. 
The economy is in confusion. There are still riots going on in the West Coast. There's confusion politically all over our country. And all of these different things are going on around us. And how can you say that we're living in the greatest time in the history of the world? Here's why. How many believe with me that light shines best in dark places? Come on. And every time it gets dark, God, I want you to know, is at work. Every time it gets quiet, God is at work. Even when I don't see it, come on, he's moving. Even when I don't feel it, he's moving. God is at work right now. And, and, and I, I just feel like we're living in the greatest time maybe in the history of the world. Since the pandemic started last March, I have led six of my neighbors to Jesus. Come on, can somebody give the Lord a shout of praise for that? Come on. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, when the pandemic started, Pastor Michael, uh, years, uh, a little over a year ago now, uh, and uh, we were all shut down, we lost every appointment that we had for the rest of the year. And as an evangelist, we had nowhere to go. Come on, how many know this is the way we make our living is through the giving of God's people. And so we lost everything, all of our income, everything shut down. We had nowhere to go. And in one week on March 17th last year, every service that we had planned for 2020 canceled in one week. And so I looked at my wife and I said, what are we going to do? And I didn't get scared and I didn't get nervous, but I did get a little confused. So I was like, Lord, what do I do here? And so the Lord said, go to your garage and pray. And that's not my typical prayer place. So the Lord said, go to your garage. So I went to my garage, and I began to call out to the Lord. And while I was out there, he said, what do you see? And I said, well, I see my car and a lawnmower and a weed eater and a rake and a blower. And he said, good, go to work. Hallelujah. And so I started a lawn service that day, and it's called Johnny's Lawn Care. Now, that's, forgive me for the horrible name like that, all right? That's the most, uh, forgive me for the lack of creativity. That's just a horrible name for a business. But it was called Johnny's Lawn Care, and I went out and I put 100 flyers out all over my community. And that week, that week, God gave me 22 lawns to cut that absolutely sustained us during the pandemic. And how many of you know fat boy needs to sweat? Come on, somebody, all right? So sweat never hurt anybody. So I started getting out and cutting my grass for all of my neighbors around my neighborhood. And while I was out cutting my grass for my neighborhood, my wife and I, two years ago, let me back up two years ago, there was a young couple that moved in, in our neighborhood. And, and uh, her, her name is Pam, moved into our neighborhood, beautiful young lady. And I, we, we were walk, my wife and I were walking through our neighborhood. We met them coming through the neighborhood, and we said hello. And she said hello back, and we heard her accent. And we said, you're not from Alabama. Where are you from? And she said, I'm from Scotland, England. And we said, what in the world are you doing from Scotland, England, doing in Mobile, Alabama? Hey, you know, that's a little bit weird right there, all right? And so uh, she uh, was from Scotland, and she said, well, I'm a professor at the University of South Alabama, which is a university right close to where we live. We said, oh, well, that's wonderful. Welcome to Mobile, Alabama. Then she said, well, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel. And she said, let me stop you right there. Stuck her hand out in my face and said, let me stop you right there and tell you that I'm an atheist. I don't do the God thing, but I appreciate what you do. And how many of you know we need discernment? Come on. We need to know when to speak and when not to speak. And as you can tell, it's hard for me not to speak, all right? So uh, the Lord said, don't say anything. Just love her. And so we just, I just kept my mouth shut. I said, well, welcome to Mobile, Alabama. We're so glad you're here. We welcome you to our community. My wife and I live one street over. If you ever need us, you call on us. Well, a year later now, the pandemic hits, and I'm out cutting her neighbor's grass, Miss Gloria. While I'm cutting her grass, she comes walking out. I said, hey, Pam, how are you? And she said, I'm scared to death. And she said, I said, why are you scared to death? She said, because of this pandemic and my children. And the Lord said, tell her now. And I said, can I tell you why I'm not scared? And she said, yes. And I began to tell her my story of what God did for me and how he saved my life and changed me. I said, Pam, when I was 16 years old, I was a borderline alcoholic going the wrong way with the wrong group of people. My life was a mess. My mom and dad were getting a divorce. Our, my family was spiraling out of control. I didn't know what to do with my life. But I went to a church because a beautiful young lady invited me to go to church. And I didn't go to church, but she was so pretty. I said, honey, I'll go anywhere with you. All right? And so I went to Moffett Road Baptist Church. And I was sitting on the back row of Moffett Road Baptist Church there in Alabama. And I was passing notes to her the whole time the minister was speaking. I wasn't listening to him. But all of a sudden he said, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And it was like his finger went 60 feet to the back row of the church where I was sitting. And it touched my heart. 
And then he said this, God loves you and God wants to help you. I said, if that's true that God loves me and God wants to help me, I want that. So I got up and I came from the back road to the front and I asked that pastor, I said, would you pray for me? I said, I don't want to go to hell. I need Jesus in my life. And I want you to know that that pastor prayed with me on July 22nd, 1979, 42 years ago now. And I want you to know I haven't had a drink of alcohol in my mouth since that night. God changed everything for me. My whole trajectory of my life changed. Right after that, I led my dad to Christ. I led my mother to Christ. I led my brother to Christ. He's a Baptist preacher. Y'all pray for him. Then I led two of my sisters to Christ, and God changed everything. I said, Pam, let me tell you why I'm not scared in this pandemic. I said, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Come on, but I know who holds tomorrow. She started crying there in the street. And she said, I've, and here's what she said to me, Anastasia. She said this. She said, I've never believed in God, but I need to believe in something. And I said, can I just read something to you? And I teach people all the time just to keep the Roman road scriptures right here on their phone. And I keep the Roman road scriptures right here on my phone. So I read Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we talked about that for just a moment. Then I read Romans 6, 23 to her, that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God. Come on, somebody. The gift of God. Somebody had to pay for our sin, but the gift of God is that Jesus paid the price for my sin. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come on. Then I said, can I read you one more? And I read Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his great love for us and that while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. And then I said, can I read you one more? And she didn't have anywhere to go. So I read Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, come on, and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. With the heart we believe and we are justified. With our mouth we confess and we are born again. And, and, she, and she said this, she said, I think I want to believe that this is true. And I want you to know, a little over a year ago, standing six feet apart, come on, standing right there in the street of my neighbor, she prayed to receive Jesus as her Savior. Come on, somebody. Now, I want you to think with me that just twenty, uh, just a, a, a few minutes earlier, uh, or a year earlier, was telling me that she was an atheist. A year later, is coming to faith in Christ. Today, she's sitting in a Pentecostal church in Mobile, Alabama. She and her family, and they're worshiping Jesus together. I've led five other neighbors to Christ just by cutting their grass. Hallelujah. Right after, that, uh, right after that, I went to, back to Portland, Oregon when the riots were going out there. How many of you heard all about that? And I, and I felt like the Lord said, go out there and get in the middle of that and shine light in the darkness that's there. How many of you know light shines best in dark places? And so we were in a little place called Gresham, Oregon, right outside of Portland, Oregon, uh, right outside of the airport there. And uh, it was a place called Harvest Assembly of God. And so we were working with that church, and we went out to area businesses, just like we did with you guys uh, about three years ago. And so we went out and gave a gift to all the business leaders and just blessed their business, especially staying open during a pandemic, right? And so we just walked into this subway shop. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. The pastor, Shane uh, Wallace, and myself, we walked in, and uh, we said, Hi, we're from Harvest Assembly of God. We got a little gift for you. It was a little bag of candy. It was Hershey's Kisses with almonds in them because those are, how many know those are anointed? Come on, all right? And so, so we had a little bag of Hershey's Kisses with almonds, and we said, Hey, we just want to give you a little bag of candy just to sweeten your day and say thank you for what you're doing in our community. Thank you for what you're doing uh, for the economy. Thank you in the middle of all these riots that you're serving all this wonderful food. And this guy, let me just tell you what he looked like. He had his hair spiked straight up, about a foot off of his head. He had piercings all over his body. And places you shouldn't have piercings, he had piercings. And he was tattooed everywhere. Anybody ever seen flames they paint on cars? He had those flames painted around his face. I mean, all the way up to his eyes. So there was ink all over this boy from everywhere you could see on him, all the way down to his toes in his sandals. He was covered in tattoos. So we said, hey, we just want to give you this candy. We want to invite you to Harvest Assembly. And he stuck his hand. I said, well, man, I'm an agnostic. I don't, I don't know about that church thing. I don't do that. 
And again, the Lord said, don't say anything. Just love on him. How I many you know it's the goodness of God that causes men to repent? And so, so we just said, hey, well, you know what? People can believe what they want to or not. They don't have to believe anything if they don't want to. It's totally up to them. And I said, but you're welcome at Harvest Assembly. So we blessed him. We turned around and walked out. When we got to the door, we turned around and looked, and he was already eating the candy out of the bag, all right? He said he went home that night. He had stuck the card that we gave him in his back pocket. When he was undressing, at the end of the day, he pulled that card out. And, and, and he felt it in his back pocket. He pulled it out. And he said, you know, those, are, those guys were really nice. He said, I think I want to go to that church just to see what they do. Come on. And, and so uh, I want you to know the next morning I, I, when I get up to preach, I see he and his wife, I found out later, are sitting on the very back row of the church. She's just as spiked up in her hair. She's just as tattooed everywhere and just as pierced as he is. And they're looking back there on the back row with a scowl on their face with their arms folded the entire sermon. And the look on their face was like, we're going to murder you right after this service. All right, that's what I was thinking because that was the look on their face. And when I gave an invitation to come to faith in Christ, he said it's the first time he ever heard God speak to him. Uh, listen to this now. He's sitting on the back row and he heard a voice that said, what they're saying is true and you need this. What they're saying is true. Not what I was saying. How many of you know he was hearing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaking to him? He said, what they're saying is true and you need this. And when I gave the invitation, he came forward to place faith in Christ. He and his wife, both of them, got saved on that day. We started, then we asked him, we said, have you ever been, heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He said, well, do I need that? And we said, yes, you do. And so, Pastor, I laid my hands on him. And as soon as I laid my hands on him, like a shotgun went off, he started speaking in tongues just as loud as he could. And then his eyes got real big. He looked at me. He said, I've always made fun of this. I didn't know this was real. Can I tell you that that young man today is in the ministry school of that church and getting ready to find out what God has for him. Now, I want to show you something. That 24 hours earlier was telling us he was an agnostic. 24 hours later was saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and a few months later going toward ministry school. I can tell you about Pam that a year earlier was telling me she was an atheist a year later because of a pandemic. I might never have ever had a chance to reach out to Pam without the pandemic. Come on. But God opened a door for us to tell them about what God can do in their life. Can I tell you, I believe we're living in the greatest time maybe ever in the history of the church to tell people about who Jesus is. Because the lines have never been more clearly drawn. There is a real pandemic. There is a real virus. It has been so politicized. And the enemy has used a spirit of fear to lock people down from coming back to the house of God are speaking the truth to people anywhere they go. And we've got to break out of that spirit of fear. And let me show you something. This has bothered me, Pastor, for the last two years. This is uh, June 2019, People Magazine's uh, cover. And there are two people on the cover of this I want to show you real quick. And, and, and I want you to see this. There are two people on here. One of them is Kate Spade, and the other one is Anthony Bourdain. All the ladies in this room probably know who Kate Spade was. Kate Spade, uh, her fashion line, her handbags, was a very, very wealthy lady. She was a billionaire, B billionaire, and uh, she was known all over the world because of her fashion line and because of her handbags. In New York City, she was found out that her husband was having an affair. She was getting a divorce from him. He was going to leave her. She became so depressed and so despondent, she left a suicide note for her daughter. She was, said, I'm an, she was an atheist. She didn't believe there was a God. She took a scar from her own fashion line and hung herself and said, there's nothing in this world for me and took her own life. I wish I could have gotten to Kate Spade and told her there is something for her in this world and his name is Jesus. Come on. Right next to her on this magazine cover is a man named Anthony Bourdain. He was a world-renowned chef. He had a show on CNN called Parts Unknown. Anybody ever hear about that? He went to the most exotic places around the world, cooking the most exotic foods and eating the most exotic foods around the world. Who wouldn't want that job? Going around the world, he was a multi-multi-millionaire. While he was filming in India, became so depressed because he was an agnostic. He didn't believe there was a God. Or if there was, you couldn't know who God was. There's no way you could know who God is. 
and became so depressed he wrote a suicide note and almost word for word said what Kate, Bourdain, uh, Kate Spade said three days earlier in New York City. He said, there's nothing in this world for me. He took a gun and shot himself and killed himself. I wish I could have gotten to Anthony Bourdain and told him there is something for him and his name is Jesus. This is what we've got to ask the Holy Spirit in the middle of this pandemic that we can awaken something in us, a spirit of faith that we can tell everyone about who Jesus is. The last instruction our Messiah gave to the church before he left this planet was this. Go into all this world and preach this gospel. Everybody say preach. Come on, say it loud. Preach. The word preach means proclaim out loud. It means open the mouth and declare out loud who Jesus is. Listen, the worst thing they can do to us is beat us up. If they do, God can heal us. The absolute worst thing they can do is kill us. If they do, we'll be with Jesus. No more bills to pay. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. No more politics. And we know what politics means. Poly means many and ticks means bloodsuckers. All right? So none of these things that we have in the world today. Jesus gave us an instruction. And it's not whether or not we think we can. It's not whether we think we should. And it's not just for uh, type A personalities or extroverts. The Bible says go. The subject of that, that, that verse is you. You go into all this world and preach, proclaim, declare out loud. Hallelujah. God wants to anoint you today to become an evangelist for this house. I said, God wants to anoint you today to be an evangelist for this house that we're going to find a way to tell everybody of the hope that is in us. Come on. Lay your hand on your heart with me right now. Come on, lay your hand on your heart. And say this out loud with me. Come on, this, just make this faith declaration out loud. Say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, anoint me today to tell other people about the God I know and the God I love and the God who saved me and the God who loves me. Help me today to go and tell everyone about the God I know in Jesus' name. I want, the, the title of my message today, if you like titles, is I'm not going to let this swallow me. I'm not going to let this swallow me. They're going to put a picture on the screen for me. I want you to see this. Forty-two years ago, the night that I got saved, my pastor gave me this picture. I've had this picture for 42 years. Anybody ever seen this picture before? I love this picture. I've held on to it now for 42 years, and I've kept it with me because it's priceless to me. And I want everybody to look at this picture real quick, would you? Everybody get, get a focus on it because it looks really bad for this frog, doesn't it? It looks like it's over for him. His head is in the mouth of this crane, and it feels like he's going down for the count. But I love what this little frog does. He reaches around, and he grabs that frog by the throat and chokes him as if to say, you ain't going to swallow me today. Come on. I want you to know life is filled with moments that we feel like the enemy is trying to swallow us. It may be our finances, it may be our health, it may be our family. It may be at night when the enemy gets really loud late at night. Come on, somebody. That we hear the lies of the enemy that it's never going to change. And there's somebody here today that you heard this even last night. That it feels like life is never going to change. It's never going to get better. And that same suicidal spirit that came on these two is trying to jump on people at a level we've never seen before. Suicide is at the highest rate in America we've ever seen as a nation. Specifically because uh, among our young people. Because they're not getting enough likes, enough views, enough follows. They can't see what they want. And they're not what they think they should be. And I want you to understand this. It feels like sometimes, come on, anybody, anybody here ever felt like every devil that is not busy has come to visit you? And, and it feels like this. Look at this picture again. It feels like life is trying to swallow us. It feels like the enemy is trying to take us down. But if we can let faith rise in our heart, come on, we can grab the enemy by the throat. And we're not going to let the situation swallow us. We're going to let faith swallow the situation. Come on. We're not going to let the situation swallow us. We're going to let faith swallow the situation. And the Bible is filled with people that the situation was trying to swallow them. And rather, in, in that moment, I want you to know that God was raising them up to do a miracle in that moment. And I want to show you this. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. I want you to read along with me, if you would. They're going to put that screen scripture on the screen. Will you read along with me? It says this. The hand of the Lord was on me. Stop right there. Can you think of anything greater in your life than the hand of the Lord being on you? I can't think of anything greater than the hand of the Lord. My children at different times have told me, they said, Daddy, 
They said, ever since I was little, when you would put your hand on my head and you would pray with me, I always felt secure because daddy's hand was on my head. Come on. And, and my, my children at different times have, have spoken that to me. I, I can't think of anything greater than the hand of the Lord being on me. See, I'd like it if Nick Saban, uh, the great coach of the great University of Alabama Crimson Tide, uh, came in here and laid his hand on me today. That'd be pretty good. I'd even like it if Kirby Smart, the coach of the Bulldogs, uh, Georgia Bulldogs, came in here and laid his hand on me today. That'd be pretty good. I'd even like it if the new coach up at Tennessee came in here and laid his hand on me. That'd be all right. I'd take a bath later, but it'd be all right, you know. But I can't think of anything greater than the hand of the Lord being on me. Now, normally when we think of the hand of the Lord on us, we think of signs and wonders. We think of miracles. We think about the glories of God. But I want you to see in this particular passage, it's not about the glories of God. It's not about a miracle situation. It's about a crisis. It's about a moment that's trying to swallow them, and they had to make a decision what they were going to believe God for. I believe this church is trying to make a decision right now with the vision of your pastors, what are we going to become? I believe the Lord sent me here today to prophesy something to you that the Lord wants to anoint this house with the anointing of an evangelist that we're not going to let the situation swallow us. We're going to let faith rise in us that will swallow the situation. Keep reading with me. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me. Why was the hand of the Lord on him? And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones in the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Now look at me if you would. The Bible tells us that Ezekiel is taken out by the Spirit of the Lord, and God shows him this valley. And he's speaking prophetically to the house of Israel, but how many of you know if it's in the book, it's speaking to us too. And so he's speaking prophetically to the house of Israel, and he's saying this. He shows him this valley, and as far and as wide as he can see, all he can see are these dry, dead, dusty bones that the Bible says had been there for a very long time. And it's a place where life used to be. And God asked the man of God, he asked him a question. He said, can these bones live? Now, how many of you know this, that Ezekiel was not a novice? Ezekiel was not some young preacher at this passage. As a matter of fact, he was a pretty old prophet at this time. He had been around. He had seen miracle after miracle after miracle. How many know this is the guy that saw the wheel inside of the wheel? Anybody remember that story? So this prophet has seen the miracles of God again and again and again. So God asked him this question. He said, can these bones live? And I want you to know that Ezekiel was a little bit bewildered. He was a little bit overwhelmed. He was a little bit taken back because he didn't give the typical response that we think what a strong prophet would give. He didn't come out and say something with the affirmative. He said, Lord, you alone know. He was obviously a little taken back because all he could see in far and as wide as he could see was death, a place where life used to be. It sounds just like America, doesn't it? Come on. That America is looking again at the valley of dry bones, and God is asking us the same question, can these bones live again? Is it possible that we can have revival in America again? Is it possible that a sweeping move of God can come across this nation again? And we know that the answer is emphatically 100%. Come on, yes. That we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. What God was waiting for was Ezekiel to get an agreement with him that somebody could get an agreement with him and prophesy over these dead bones. That dead bones, you don't have to stay dead anymore. Come on. Because one can put a thousand a flight. Two can put, come on, two, 10,000. Not, not, you would think if one could do a thousand, two could do 2,000, right? But in the kingdom, it's not addition. It's multiplication. So if, you go, if two can put, uh, do 10,000, three can move 100 million. What God was trying to say to Ezekiel was, I need you to get an agreement with me, Ezekiel, that what you see in front of you that looks dead and looks dry and looks dusty cannot live again. And he just needed him to get an agreement with him that if he could just get an agreement with God that what is dead can come to life again. He said, Lord, I don't know. Only you know. Now, I love what God does in verse 4, that God tells him exactly what he wants him to do. How many of you have ever put something together before without reading the instructions? Would you be honest and show me? Okay, how many of you, like me, missed a step and you had to take it back apart? Come on, hold your hand up. If you missed something right here, you're going to miss one of the steps. I want you to read verse 4 with me. Come on, it's on the screen. Read along with me. It says this. Then he said to me, prophesy. Everybody say prophesy. Come on, say it loud. Prophesy. 
That word prophesy, again, means open the mouth and declare out loud the things of God. All right? His word will not return what? All right. Keep reading. God, God takes him out. Ask him the question, can these bones live? He said, Lord, I just don't know. You're the only one that knows. So God says, all right, here's what I want you to do. He says in verse 4, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear what? In other words, Ezekiel, I don't need your opinion because your opinion is not going to change anything. I don't need your thoughts, Ezekiel. I need, you, I need you to speak my thoughts because my word is not going to change. It's going to accomplish something. So I want you to speak the word of the Lord. Verse 5, keep reading. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'm going to make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tenants to you and make flesh come upon you and cover with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now look at me if you would. Everybody get this right here. God takes him out and he shows him this valley. And as far and as wide as he can see, it's nothing but death. I was, I, I, we went to an Atlanta Braves game the other night. Uh, my son was here for a baseball tournament. And I, while I was there, I was videotaping all the people as they were leaving the stadium the other night. And I saw all those thousands and thousands of people. I thought, Lord, where are they going? And as we look at our culture today, it looks like there's just nothing but death. See, if you watch ABC or CBS or NBC or MSNBC or Fox Network, you're going to be depressed. We better start reading a little more Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to find out what the future is of what God is about to do. And so I was looking at all of those people and wondering, Lord, where are they all going? Because it looks like just what Ezekiel saw was a valley of death, that everything is dry, everything is dead. It's where life used to be, but America will never rise again to prominence. It's far too far gone. It'll never change again in America. And we're looking at that same thing. So God says, here's what I want you to do. Prophesy over these bones. Prophesy over the breath. Prophesy over the tenants. And say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones, hear what? The word of the Lord. You start speaking this word because this word will not return to me void. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Ezekiel did not have to do it. He could have rebelled. But I love what happens in verse 7. Read along in verse 7 with me. In verse 7, it says this. Come on, say it out loud with me. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Can you say that again? So I prophesied as I was commanded. Say it again. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And look what happened. And as I was prophesying, opening my mouth, declaring the things of God, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. I, uh, look at me. I want you to hear this. The man of God is standing out there looking out over America, looking out over Cornelia, Georgia, and it looks like there's just dry death everywhere. Can these bones live again? And God says, begin to speak my word. Begin to speak my word. Begin to speak my word. Come on, say it. Begin to speak my word. Come on, shout it. Begin to speak my word. And he said, all of a sudden, life can come over these dead places. And all of a sudden, with no guarantee that anything was going to change, with no guarantee that anything was going to happen, out of sheer obedience and raw determination, the man of God just began to speak the word of the Lord. And all of a sudden there was a rattling and there was, there was a convulsing and there was a shaking that was going on all those bones. And all of a sudden skin covered them and tendons covered them, and, and, but there was no breath in them. If he would have stopped right here, all he had was a valley full of corpses. He was at the halfway place of a miracle. Can I tell you, the halfway place to a miracle is the most miserable place that maybe we can ever be because you're halfway between death and halfway between life. You're halfway between a curse and halfway between a promise. You're halfway between the past and halfway between the future. The halfway place is a miserable, miserable place to be. So if he was stopped right here, all he had was a valley full of corpses because as he began to speak, all of a sudden there was a convulsing and a rattling and a shaking of all these bones. Can you even imagine how his faith began to increase? Because one sentence earlier, he's looking at a valley of nothing but dead bones of places where life used to be. One sentence later, now there's bodies covered with skin and tendons and all of a sudden that something is happening in this valley and life is beginning to come back in them. But he's at the halfway place. Did he stop right here? No, if you know the story, you know he didn't stop. Keep reading along with me, would you, in verse 9. Come on, read this with me. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Will you read verse 10 out loud? Come on, read it out loud with me. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Come on, say it again. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Shout it again. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And look what happened. And breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet. What? A 
vast army. Let me ask you something. The vast army, was the vast army in the house of God or out in the valley of death? Was it in the house of God or in the valley of death? It was in the valley of death waiting for someone to come and speak the word of the Lord over them that dead marriage, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead finances, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead family, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead business, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead church, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead city, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead nation, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead world, you don't have to be dead anymore. As a matter of fact, will you prophesy with me? America, live again. Come on, say it. America, live again. Come on, America, live again. Say it, Cornelia, live again. Come on, Cornelia, live again. Shout it, come on, Cornelia. You might be the only people in this city saying that. Come on. We might be the only people in America who just declared that right now. We just don't know. But one can put a 1,000 of flight. Come on. Two can put 10,000 of flight. There's a whole bunch of us in this room and more watching online that God says, here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. What you see looks dead. What you see. How many of you know what, what my mama used to tell me? Don't believe anything you see and only half of what you hear. You better not let your eyes deceive you. You better not let your ears deceive you because we're looking at America and thinking we can never have a, re a revival again. But God is at work. Something is brewing under the surface that God is awakening his people and saying, don't you go to sleep. Don't you let the enemy deceive you. Speak life over the dead bones. Speak life over the dead bones. Come on. Speak life over the dead bones. Come on. Speak life over the dead bones. Because he was just waiting for somebody to get in an agreement with him because he said, if you can just get an agreement with me, Ezekiel, what looks dead to you can come to life again. If there's something dead around you today, I'm here to tell you, God can bring it to life again. And I believe that we're about to see what the Bible promised, a church without spot or wrinkle. We're about to see the great in gathering because things are escalating so fast politically and economically and socially. Less than 4% of the millennial generation professes to be born again today. Did you hear what I just said? Less than 4% of the millennial generation professes to be born again. George Washington said we are always just one generation away from complete apostasy. We're looking at America, and God is asking, can these bones live? And the answer is emphatically, yes. And we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Don't let this swallow. Come, can you put that picture back on the screen for me? Can you put it back up there one more time? This is where we are as a nation. This is where some of you might be in a, as your family. This might be you and your business. This might, be, this might be you and your finances. That it feels like you're going down for the count. That the enemy is trying to swallow you. And God's saying, let faith rise in you. And you reach around and you grab the enemy by the neck and say, you're not going to swallow me today. I hope you'll walk out of here today saying, I got the devil right where I want him. Come on. That I'm not going to let him swallow me. I'm going to swallow the situation. Go to 2 Kings with me. Let me show you something else real quick. 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to show you something of what we know as the Shunammite woman. 2 Kings chapter 4 and beginning in verse 28. I want to show you something of what we know the scripture as the Shunammite woman. Anybody know the story I'm referring to? It's an amazing story. And let me give you the background before we read this particular passage. In the story, the prophet of God, Elisha, is staying in this woman in this region, and this woman takes care of the prophet of God while he's there. And while he's there, she builds on the back of her house a little room, and she puts back there a bed and a table and a lamp, and they call it the prophet's chamber and the prophet's quarter, and they took care of the man of God while he was there. And she fed him, and she gave him a place to rest. When he got ready to leave her, he said, how can I bless you? And he and she, uh, he said, how can I bless you? You've been so good to me. How can I bless you? And then his servant, Gehazi, his armor bearer, piped up and he said, she doesn't have a son. She, she doesn't have a son. How many of you know in Israel, uh, if not to have a son was to be looked upon a little bit as an outcast? Because they like very, very large families and they wanted that firstborn son because they wanted to pass the family name to that firstborn male child. Nothing wrong with the girls, but they just wanted that male child so they could perpetuate the family name. So she didn't have a son that she could pass her family name to. So when she said, when, when Gehazi said she doesn't have a son, Elisha looked at her and said, one year from now, you will have a son. Did God give her a son? Yes, he did. 
And if you know the story, the son grew for a while. We don't exactly know how old he was, but he grew for a while because he was out in the field, the Bible tells us in the first four chapters. He's working with his daddy out in the field, but all of a sudden he falls dead. He says, my head, my head, and he falls dead in the field. We don't know if he had an aneurysm. We don't know if he had a brain tumor. We don't know what happened, but he fell dead in the field. The dad scoops him up and runs back to the home to bring him to the mother who was there at the house. And this is where the story picks up. Read verse 28 with me, would you? Second Kings chapter 4 and verse 28, it says this. Elisha said to Gehazi, uh, 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 um, excuse me, verse 28, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. In other words, she says, why would you give me a son only for him to be taken away? Why would you answer a prayer request of mine only for it to be dashed? Why would you even do that? So the prophet of God could have looked at her and he could have said, look, lady, you gave me a bed, you gave me a lamp, you gave me some food, you took care of me while I was here, but I prayed, God gave you a son, you've had your son for a little while, I'm sorry he is dead, but it's time to plan the funeral, bury your boy. Is that what he said? No, he obviously loved this woman. He obviously loved this little boy. I want you to read verse 29. Look at what it says with me in verse 29. Elisha said to Gehazi, all right, here's what we're going to do. Tuck your cloak into your belt. We're not going to let this swallow us. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet, and if anyone greets you, do not answer them. Lay my staff on the boy's face. Keep reading. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. How many mamas in here say, if something's going on with my child, I'm going to be there, all right? Mama said, I'm going with you. Read verse 30, verse 31. It says this. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound of response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. Stop right there if you would. The Bible tells us that the prophet of God didn't just look at the situation and say, it's not going to change. He didn't let the situation swallow him. He reached around and grabbed it and said, I'm going to believe God for a miracle in a crisis situation. So here's what he did. He said, all right, I love you and I believe him. Our God is able. So he hands his staff to his servant who's a lot younger than him. Elisha's pretty old at this time. So he says, listen, you run on ahead. I'll be behind you. Just go lay my staff on the boy's face. Now, how many of you know there was an anointing on that staff? It was a, an, an extension of his anointing. How many remember that when uh, Elisha, they laid his bones and someone in a grave, they came back to life? So there's an extension of the anointing. He said, you just take my staff, go run, and lay it on this little boy. I'll be there, and we're going to believe for him. So uh, Gehazi takes off running. He goes up there, lays the staff on the little boy, but there's no sound of response. Elisha and the, and the woman get there a little bit later, and they say, look, we did what you told us to do. We laid the staff on the little boy's face, but there's no response. Did, did Elisha look at the woman and say, look, I'm so sorry. We prayed that God would give you a son. We believed that God would take care of him, but I'm so sorry you had him for a little while. We've, done, we've prayed. We've laid our staff on him, but it's time to plan the funeral. Bury your boy. Is that what he said? Come on, read verse 32. Keep reading with me. Come on, read along. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. Look what happens now. This is a shocking statement. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And as he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Stop right there, would you? Can you even imagine the situation? Elisha gets there, the, the, uh, the, they've laid the staff on the little boy. The mom is probably weeping because the little boy is dead. And the Bible says that Elisha got there and he began to walk back and forth in the room. They had very, very long garments on. They had, they had their headpiece and they had very long beards. So I, can, I, I wasn't there, but I have a vivid imagination. That he's probably walking back and forth in the room and he's rubbing his beard and rubbing his headpiece, which represented part of his anointing. He's rubbing his beard and rubbing his headpiece. And God says, well, here's what I want you to do. Just lay on top of him. Okay, so he comes up there and he crawls up on top of this boy and lays on top of him, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, in the middle of a pandemic. How many of you know that's pretty close? Come on, somebody. He's laying on top of this boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. He's laying on top of this boy. And the Bible says that his mama was there with him, so she's watching. How many of you know she's probably thinking, what in the world is this crazy prophet doing to my son? How many of you know when God sends a miracle, he rarely asks us how he should do it? 
He said, all right, I'm about to do a miracle. So the prophet lays on top of him, and the Bible says that all of a sudden the little boy's body began to come warm. In other words, life is beginning to come back into this little boy, but he's not yet alive. He's in the halfway place of a miracle. If he stops right here, 98.6 on a cold, dead frame will make it get warm. But it didn't bring it back to life. It's halfway to the place of where God wants it. And, and, and still, the boy's body grew warm, but he's not back to life. Did the prophet get up off of him and say, look, Shunammite woman, I'm so sorry. Listen, we, we have prayed. God gave you this son. You had him for a little while. I've laid my staff on him. I've laid on top of him. I, I don't know what else to do. I, I think it's time to plan the funeral. It's time to bury your little boy. Is that what he did? Come on, read verse 35 with me. I love this story. Come on, verse 35. It says this. Verse 35 says, Elisha turned away. And walked back and forth in the room. And then he got on the bed and stretched out on him. Come on, what does it say? What does it say? Come on. Come on, real loud. What does it say? And then there's this little throwaway line. It says, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Now, I wasn't there, but I've got a vivid imagination. All right, so the prophet of God comes there. The mom is crying. They've laid the staff on him. He's laid on top of him, but then he walks back and forth in the room again. So he's walking back and forth in the room, and he's saying, God, we've laid the staff on him. God, I've laid on top of him. What do we do? God said, lay on him again. So he crawls up on top of him and lays on him mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. How many of you know that's real close? I was in Walmart a few weeks ago, and I sneezed, and I cleared the whole aisle. Hallelujah. It's real easy to shop in the middle of a pandemic, I'm just telling you. And here he is laying on top of this boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And the Bible says the boy sneezed how many times? Seven times and opened his eyes. So he's laying there, get this picture now, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And all of a sudden this little boy starts convulsing. (laughs) And then he does it a second time, come on. And then a third time, come on, do it with me. (laughs) Then a fourth time, come on. (laughs) Then a fifth time, come on. (laughs) Come on, and a sixth time, come on. (laughs) And then a seventh time, come on. (laughs) And then the Bible says... He opened his eyes, and you can read the next verses, and then they come in, and the mother gets him, and she goes and feeds him something because dead people are hungry. He needed something to eat to sustain him. Those that are dead out there are waiting for somebody to come spiritually feed them so that they can come back to life. And I want you to know that the prophet of God, the woman comes with her son, bows at the feet of the prophet of God to give praise to God that her little boy, what was dead, has come back to life. She didn't let it swallow her. She reached her ground and grabbed the enemy by the, by the neck and said, you're not going to swallow me. My faith is going to swallow this situation. The prophet of God said, I'm not going to let this swallow me. My faith is going to swallow the situation. And there's no indication that the prophet of God ever got up off of this little boy. He's covered in snot and spit because this boy has been sneezing all over him. What is the first thing we do when somebody sneezes around us? Dear God, get away from me. Can you cover your mouth? Get away. But there's no indication that the prophet of God ever got up off this little boy. He laid there, oh, sneeze one, come on, sneeze two, come on, sneeze three, come on, sneeze four, come on, sneeze five, come on, sneeze six, come on, sneeze seven. And what we've got to do, I want you to understand, the only thing dead people know how to do is spit on us. That's all they know how to do. And we can look at the homosexual community. We can look at the Muslim or the Hindu. We can look at people around us and say, look at their sorry state of life. Come on. When what God is saying, all they know how to do is be angry. They don't know any better. Cows moo, dogs bark, cats meow, and sinners sin. That's all they know how to do. And they don't know the truth that we know. They don't have the light that we have. So we need to lay on top of them. Spirit, Don't go out of here and say, I said lay on top of somebody. Spiritually speaking, we need to lay on top of this culture and Cornelia and say, you keep sneezing on me. You keep sneezing on me. You keep making fun of us. You keep laughing at us. You can keep mocking us as we praise our God and as we attend our church. But we're not going to stop. You can sneeze on us again and again and again and again and again and we're not going to stop until we see what God is able to do. The Lord wants to anoint you to crawl on top of this community and speak life to them. 
God's calling this church to stand with your pastors and say, God, the spirit of suicide is trying to kill them. Come on. God, the enemy is trying to kill them. Help us, oh God, to speak life to them. That, can you put that picture back on the screen for me? That we're not going to let this situation swallow us. We're going to believe by faith. We're going to swallow the situation. And there's enough believers in this room. There's enough believers watching online right now to turn Cornelia upside down and right side up if we can activate our faith and say, I'm going to tell them what my God can do. Because I want you to know that Elisha could have looked at the little boy and just walked away. I want you to understand that Ezekiel could have looked at the valley of dry bones and he could have walked away. Come on, am I telling the truth? But Ezekiel didn't do that. And if God did it for Ezekiel, and if God did it for a Shunammite woman, can he do it for Michael and Anastasia Welburn? Can he do it for a group of people called Revived Church? Can he do it in a place that says, we're not going to look at this culture and let it swallow us. We're going to grab the enemy by the throat, and we're going to swallow this enemy.